Okay. Uh, yes, we are live indeed. We are live as can be with Mr. Rory Miller from Miller Media. How are you today? Very well. How are you doing, John? Hey, I am great. Uh, very excited. If you're uh, watching this on YouTube or live, thank you for tuning in. And of course, on the podcast, Media and market, market, Marketing on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play, Spotify we're coming out on. And uh, really appreciate your time. I'm excited today because we have a little bit of a history, uh, Rory and myself, uh, from uh, a, uh, a Facebook group and a, and a sort of insider mastermind group, uh, uh, Mr. Jason Horning. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we basically have uh, shared a lot of thoughts about what it takes to grow a business using Facebook to really also learn Facebook and do it the right way. And Rory is one of the masters. So I'm excited to, to have you on uh, today. And, and actually, Rory, if you can, Break it down a little bit for me, that whole sort of transition from, uh, I guess, early earlier years in your digital career to now sort of current status of, of expert, if I can use that term, and, uh, you know, how that sort of worked in your, uh, in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the whole journey started really about three years ago is when my wife found out she was pregnant. Uh, we got to talking about how we wanted to handle that with our lives, and we knew we wanted her to stay home. So... <laughs> The loss of our income meant, you know, if we wanted to live the same lifestyle, we needed to find a way to supplement that income. And um, that really began my search into, you know, what ways can I make money from home? What online business models are there? And we started with e-commerce and drop shipping. And, um, you know, we did a couple of different models and a few different stores and experimented that with a few years. But, you know, the center of gravity for all Internet marketing right now is Facebook. So I sort of accidentally, if you will, over 18 months, spent almost every day inside Facebook managing my own ads. And then got better at it, talked to some of my friends that own businesses, um, you know, just talking to them about how Facebook might help them in their own business. And then somebody offered, hey, man, how about I pay you to just do this for me? I don't really want to know how to do it myself. And that was when the light bulb went on, like, oh, there's actually something I could offer business owners and, and a value that I can deliver. And, um, once I started doing that, then I really pursued, you know, how do I get better at this? Um, and that brings me around to Jason Horning. Obviously, you, you can't be in the Facebook ad space very long without hearing about Jason's content. So, I took his digital course and a few months later, um, one of the offers came out through email to, to work one-on-one -on -one with him and do some mentorship. And um, at the time I was actually active duty military in the army. We knew we were getting out. So I, I said, you know what, this is what I want to do full time. So I'm going to learn from the best. And I, I got as close to him as I could and started building the agency. And then that brought us to where we are today. Oh, that's great. And in fact, uh, that, that whole um, discussion around going from, like you mentioned, uh, you know, with your wife and the military in the background and you're trying to figure things out. If, if you go back a little bit in time, um, how did you go from, you know, you know, point A, I guess I should say, and, you know, moving forward to like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do Facebook ads. You know, you mentioned e-commerce, et cetera. You know, did you just decide I'm going to kind of load up my credit cards and start to learn this thing? Uh, you know, what's that transition point? for? Because really the theme of today's uh, broadcast is this idea that you are building really a full-time business, a serious business with sort of a part-time schedule. And uh, a lot of people deal with this in the entrepreneur space anyway, uh, especially in that sort of transition point, right? Um, if you could take me back a little bit, how did that kind of start and what struggles or what sort of challenges did you see or have? Because obviously when you're investing in Facebook, and we know it's not just a, a straight line, right? Um, right. There's going to be some uh, investments and some expenditures that happen there. How did you sort of balance all of that? Yeah, so, you know, my wife and I had been smart with our money for um, the earlier years of our marriage, and we had a little bit of savings. And so she and I really started looking at this business models. We were fortunate, I think more fortunate than most, we had a little bit of a cash cushion to invest in some of these so we spent a little bit on training, learning from people that were doing these drop shipping models and trying to get some of the methods. And then we spent some on ads and, and actually we made a lot of mistakes. I mean, we probably spent, um, you know, 10 or 15,000 just on courses. And then we spent another 15 or 20 grand on ads. Um, and not all of that was spent well. And there was, to your point, some money put on credit cards. But, you know, to be honest with you, I've learned more from the bad expenses and the bad choices I've made than I have from the wins that I've had in e-commerce. So, uh, and the first thing to answer your question, I think specifically, is you got to increase your comfort with risk because there are no guarantees with any business model, really. But at the end of the day, I would much rather put my stock in myself than in, you know, working in a corporate job and relying on somebody else to provide that job for me and not knowing whether or not it's going to be there year to year. 
I would much rather go out on my own and at least be taking risks and, and showing confidence in myself. Um, and then from a comfort standpoint, you have to get comfortable with removing things from your life. So you're going to have, if you have your full-time job and you have a certain lifestyle you're living now, you're not going to be able to continue to live that same lifestyle and start a business on the side. There's only 24 hours in the day. So something has to give. So you have to make a decision about value propositions. What's the most important thing to you? Is it important to you to keep up with the bachelor every week at the expense of growing your business like you want to? Or are you willing to cut out the one hour of TV time or the one hour of social time with friends in order to be at home, honing your skills, developing the skills you need to build your business and, and putting in the work. Yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, those are some hard lessons though. And most people are not ready for that. I think, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you come to this earth, you're not just born an entrepreneur, right? It's got to be <laughs> sort of nurtured and, and, and built up over time. Uh, was there anything in your past and sort of, as you look at this, I mean, you obviously, you had regular jobs, you know, in the corporate environment and then, Along the way, it must have been something in your sort of environment or in your experience that said, you know what, uh, my name is Rory and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to go for it, right? There's there's no, obviously not just one day to the next that that happens, but what was it? I'm just curious about that that made you kind of uh, hone for this. Yeah, I think probably the best answer to that is that um, when it came time for me to make the decision to become an entrepreneur, uh, I had a, an unchanging motivation to do so, and that was my unborn child and my wife. It wasn't at that point. It wasn't about me anymore. I had to deliver and show up in the way that I wanted to show up for my family and for my wife and for my daughter. And that was motivation that, that doesn't just go away. It's not like I just did it for the status in the Lamborghini. Uh, but coincidentally, at the same time, I was also going through training for special forces in the army, which is incredibly taxing and difficult on the mind and the body. And so, uh, it, you know, I guess it's no coincidence that I was at the same time trying to build my own business as I was going through this very physically demanding and mental, mentally demanding training. And I think the, the better I got at one, the better it actually helped me perform at the other. So That's interesting. Yeah. And then uh, in your uh, uh, sort of, I'm, I'm just curious about this, when you had your regular jobs, if you will, yeah. uh, did, you, did you feel like you were a little bit of, uh, like a fish out of water? Like, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not a nine to five guy. Like, did this start early on or was it always uh yeah, I could play that. But you know what? The army, the wife, the kids, you know, that was the defining moment. Or was there something even before that, do you think? Yeah, I, if I go back far enough, most of the jobs I've ever had were sales jobs and specifically working in gyms for, for the very reason you're saying. I never liked, I think one summer I worked for two months in a cubicle, eight hours a day, and it was the worst experience I could ever possibly imagine. I mean, just inefficient, you know, a lot of wasted time, not enough. It just, it drove me crazy. So when I finally came around to, to a regular job for me, that was at least sales because I, I start to have some control over my own income. So it's, you know, it's, it's leaning towards the entrepreneurial track and then working in a gym environment is, is almost like retail. It's very non-conventional hours, um, you know, sometimes late, sometimes early, but it's dynamic, a lot of energy. And so I really respond to that environment, but I think, I, you know, ironically being in the military helped me realize more than anything, I don't want to have a boss anymore. I'm just tired of having people tell me what to do and when to do it. So I decided, you know, if anybody's going to make bad decisions, I'm going to make them and I'll be the one that, that deals with it. Interesting. Yeah. So it was these, uh, <clears throat> these stress levers of like, yeah, I don't want a boss. I, I don't want to feel restricted. You know, uh, uh, your wife, uh, the kid, it was like a number of things because, um, you know, some of the entrepreneurs that I speak to and the business owners, <clears throat> they'll say, yeah, I didn't like the nine to five, but actually I probably was almost a born an entrepreneur because my father was one. My mother had her own business. You know, the, the whole family infrastructure was salespeople or whatever in, in your world. Was that the case or were they uh, just sort of uh, uh, normal breadwinners in that normal setting? <laughs> Yeah, it was actually the opposite. So my grandfather, um, my mom's side was an entrepreneur. He started a couple of businesses and he got burned a couple of times oh. Had some business partners that, you know, either did him wrong or, or cut, took some money from him. So the idea of being an entrepreneur in my mom's eyes was the scariest thing in the world, arguably scarier than me being in the military and, and doing anything related to that. And my mom was very corporate, like vice president of a few companies, you know, just very oh. big corporate mind um, in how she operates. Um, but on the other hand, my dad's kind of the opposite. He's never really stepped in. He's just now, I think, in his 60s, stepping into his entrepreneurial spirit. He always had it, but he's always 
it, it, his attitude about providing for his family was to take the safe route and to take the job. So he and I had the same problem. We just handled it very differently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and uh, is he uh, sort of uh, picking up some of your uh, tips on uh, Facebook or sort of this digital marketing stuff, or is that just uh, sort of too far out right now? <laughs> no, hopefully, I, hopefully I'll be able to bring my dad on as a client uh, this year. All right. Oh, man. Yeah, he's starting a service business, so I'll help him with his ads and get him up and running. That's great, great. Um, yeah, and uh, we talked about uh, Facebook at the top here. Um, this is really great, by the way. I appreciate the, the perspectives because a lot of the listeners and people that I talk to also personally deal with exactly this issue of, you know, I want to grow, I want to start my own business, but I, I simply just can't, you know, drop everything and, and head over here and do that, right? They've got to balance all of that. But uh, Facebook is a great platform, of course, uh, just the incredible levels of, of targeting and opportunities for positioning media to uh, that targeted audience, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we, uh, we discuss in the forums and whatnot. Uh, but uh, what is it about Facebook in your mind that really suits you personally in terms of obviously you have the history you just discussed, but also that you can use for uh, clients as you're building your business? Uh, what's sort of the uniqueness of Facebook versus, let's say, Google, the other uh, you know small player in this space? Uh, what would you say to that? Uh, I think the the main strength of Facebook continues to be the ability to target, and I mean laser target your ideal customer. Um, and it's really you're only limited by your your creativity. And the great thing about Facebook is all the data, everything that happens with your ads is tracked. So if you do the initial targeting well, all of the audience data that's built over all the dollars that you spend, it just continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger through custom audiences and lookalike audiences. And um, I think the, the single best thing about digital marketing as a whole, and, and obviously on Facebook as well, is it's it's really democratized advertising because, you know, 50 years ago, if you wanted to advertise, and especially if you wanted to test 10 different ads, you needed thousands, not hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to put these on platforms like TV and radio and direct mail. And now for five bucks a day, you can iterate and test your ads in, in 30 days. And it's just made this, this world accessible to a whole new group of people. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so true. Um, and uh, in your business, uh, Miller Media, uh, or Miller, uh, sort of Miller, Miller Made Media, sorry, we'll get to that uh, in a bit here, but uh, what type of clients do you work with? What's sort of your best, uh, your best sort of your quote unquote perfect client? Yeah, so I, I'm, I think it's probably because of how I got my start, uh, but I'm partial to e-commerce. Um, I find that, uh, you know, a lot of people in the e-commerce world are, are missing a huge opportunity where they're advertising. And so uh, the solution I bring is being able to come in and, and, and not really reinvent the wheel, but just restructure it, maybe redesign it a little bit and get some, some really good results for people. Um, I do have some information clients and, you know, when you're starting a business, you don't say no to anybody really. But so I've worked with people in, in various industries, but I think e-commerce is really my favorite. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, and uh, as you work with, uh, well, clients in general, but certainly e coms as we're talking about that, um, what are the, you know, one or two perhaps biggest mistakes or, or even challenges that you see coming on board? Because obviously one of the first things we do in this uh, sort of onboarding a client is, well, there's, there's the whole business relationship. But then when you actually start looking at it, you sort of have to audit and verify, you know, what's what's working, what's not working, et cetera, start developing strategies. But then I'm sure you see like a common pattern of like, oh, yeah, here we go again. You know, this thing, that thing, you know, oh, you're, you're leaving money on the table over here. Look at this. Like, what are those, you know, one, two things, maybe three things that you see all the time? Yeah. So I think the biggest mistake that I see is that people don't actually have a strategy for how they execute their advertising. I think people know, hey, I need to be on Facebook and I want to be on Facebook. But then they just jump on there and they spend some money on ads and they just check the block. And there's really no thought to how how is this how do these ads become a, a part of the customer journey? And you know, can I can I show them this video over here and then maybe retarget those people here and then and then drive them to my store? It's like, well, I'm just gonna send people straight to the store and hopefully I get sales and you know, they spend twenty thousand dollars and then they're hiring me, like, hey, can you figure this thing out? I don't know what's going wrong. <laughs> and the first thing is we need to have a plan. Like, what does your customer journey look like? Where do you want ads to be a part of that? And, and, you know, how do we do this for the least cost possible? Yeah, so that's very interesting because it's the sort of the, the strategy and the principles around how we get to outline goals rather than just diving into the actual ads. In fact, uh, I don't know if it was Jason or somebody else who said, 
you know, 50% plus is not about the ads. It's about, you know, like, like you said, building out the strategy, what are your goals and defining that environment before you even start any ads, right? Right. Absolutely. I think a lot of people go into it thinking that an ad's value is only if it converts to a sale. And I, I think when you do that, you really short circuit a lot of the buyer's journey. And depending on, you know, what source you're reading, people need to see your content from seven to as many as 21 times before they decide to make a purchase. So yeah. if you throw a bunch of ads out that are just trying to drive a sale, you, you might have some success, but you're only capturing a small fraction of the population that's willing to make that purchase decision within a day of seeing your first ad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, uh, since we're talking about this sort of setting the stage, uh, developing the strategies, how do you communicate, um, sort of expectations around to the client. Obviously each client is <clears throat> is different. You, you could have more of a, a starter kind of starting in the, uh, you know, here on, on this side where somebody is, you know, two, three years down has a funnel established and really has a, a really reputable business going. But how do you set the expectations for uh, for results in the e-com space? For Facebook? Yeah, so that, and, and this sort of brings me around to, you know, big mistake number two is a lot of business owners don't know their numbers that they need from their advertising in order to be successful. So what I'll do is, is come in and establish some very basic things like average order value and lifetime customer value and try to use those numbers to reverse engineer what we can afford to spend on ads. Um, but then I just show them like, hey, this this is what I'm going for. These are the numbers we need to make your business successful. Um, you know, This is the, the return on ad spend we need. And then the biggest thing I need is, per, hey, if I can get you these numbers, can I scale this thing for you? And, um, you know, typically people are saying, heck yeah, if I can put a dollar in and get $5 out, I'll give you $100,000 right now. Yeah, exactly. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, we use the profitability matrix uh, ourselves. It's great, you know, reversing, yeah. uh, kind of just start with the back end to the front and, and mapping it out. It's uh, it's awesome. And then, and then of course, yeah, you're dealing with different business owners and their, their, uh, their own sort of psychology on ads right some find it to be an expense other consider it to be an investment you know because again you could map it all out show the numbers and they come back with um, hey rory it looks all good and we'll give you 30 days and then you say well that you can't work under those conditions we need at least 60 right i mean that's yeah it's back to that sort of the business operational side and that adds a level of complexity that you know you only get from actually experiencing this because you know i meet uh, guys and gals who could run ads but then it comes time to really discuss the the entire 360 entity of like moving you uh, then uh, you can get into challenges how do you handle those uh, setting of expectations at that business level yeah i'm so glad you mentioned mindset because i think that's probably if i had to label the biggest challenge for all entrepreneurs is mindset because you you know it takes a certain level of belief like we were talking about earlier to to even start a business it takes a whole nother level of belief to go from part-time to full-time and yeah. And even within that, it takes an additional level of belief to start making from 50,000 to 100,000 a year, then to a million. Like you're constantly having to grow in your mindset and belief about what's possible. And, um, you know, the reality for what we do is some people aren't going to be on the level you are in terms of the mindset. You're going to have some business owners, like you said, that, hey, this is an expense. If I don't see a profit in the first two weeks, I'm cutting my losses and I'm out of here. And it's, you know, it's it, 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 maybe if you really, if you need to put food on the table, take that client and do what you can. But I, you know, my advice otherwise would be like, Hey, we're not a good fit because yeah. I don't want to take a project that you're going to be unhappy with. Cause then when you talk to somebody about Facebook ads and my name comes up, I have somebody out there who's had a bad experience and, and really it was just a mismatch in expectations. So I try to be crystal clear with people ahead of time. And you mentioned an audit in the, in the um, initial conversation. And that's definitely something I start with. I don't even let anybody hire me until we do an audit because then I get to see their account, they get to see what working with me is like, and then after that, we can decide if we both wanna move forward and if it makes sense, but you know, at least then we do so knowingly. Yeah, yeah. Man, there's some uh, juicy uh, value bombs here uh, for everybody watching and listening. Uh, this is where you can really uh, escape hell in terms of getting yourself into hell, meaning just skip that whole thing in the, in the get-go. And uh, uh, I know that for some of the folks who are, you know, starting a business or or perhaps have a few clients already it's exciting to say man i think i'm going to close this next client it's five grand a month and yet it's not a fit so it's like now skip the money and just get a better deal because of the holistic nature of that other deal or in the future one door closes and other opens is going to be much better for you but it is tough when that that goes down it is really tough and i can't i you know every time i've ever 
given a discount or not listen to my gut and taking a client I didn't want to a hundred percent of the time it has bit me in the butt. So, you know, yeah. if anybody listening could take that away, just it, your gut will tell you when you need to make a decision or not. If it's telling you not to make a decision, then walk away yeah. and be done with it. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. And just uh, finally on the, on the Facebook, are there, uh, do you limit yourself by, let's say that you, um, uh, have a client that seems to be a good fit on many levels. In fact, they seem to checklist all of the things that you look for, um, but they may not have, uh, you know, so the numbers are are close, but they may not have the budget entirely. Uh, do you draw a line where you say, listen, uh, everything seemed okay here until you said I only have 5,000 a month or, you know, like do you draw the line to say, hey, any client below 5,000, I can't work with them or because uh, I know uh, some uh, consultants do that just flat out. Yeah, I haven't established any minimum for the budget. Um, it, it's it's kind of a, you know, I guess for me, this is part of the art of it. It takes me looking at somebody's account and then I really just go off off how I feel about it. Once I've seen the numbers and had a look at some of the data and especially interacted with the business owner, if I've got a good feeling about it, I think I could be successful. I'll take it. Um, yeah. I, I, I just signed on a client last month whose minimum budget, I think, was $100 a day. Uh, but, it, you know, that we already agreed, hey, if we're seeing results, we're able to scale this, and that's exactly what happened. So we're already spending three or $400 a day because we were able to get the results for them. But, uh, I, you know, I didn't want to turn them away just because of the low budget. Right, right. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of variables there. And as a as a business owner, and especially an entrepreneur starting up an agency or, or you know, just a side, side hustle until you sort of get your, your feet going, uh, there's some uh, there's some tough learning, but you know as you continue to watch and listen to podcasts like these, hopefully this type of value will really resonate and and help uh, a person that's watching listening to to make the right choices. But clearly, and I know you had uh, mentioned that in your uh, registration here uh, for this broadcast that uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this the the idea of failure and and success. I mean we we've heard this before: failure equals success, etc. But it's just the, you know, the, the slogan just is the slogan, right? Like experiencing it is a whole right. different level, but uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, I mentioned it earlier and I think it might've been before we were recording, but I, I've it, consistently in my life, I've always learned more from the things that I did not do well than the things I did well. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, it's so easy when you have success, you, it's easy to sort of rest on your laurels and think you've got it all figured out. But man, when, when you fail, especially as an entrepreneur, there's nobody to blame but yourself. And it, it forces you to take a look in the mirror and really evaluate. And I think, you know, if you're willing to, to go into that thought process, there's always a productive education that comes out of that. You're always able to take some lessons learned and some best practices and move forward with it. Um, and, and anybody that's that's part time looking to go full time, you know, it, it, it definitely is a major mindset shift. But if you're part time and you're running an agency right now or you're taking care of clients, your focus is not growing your agency. Your focus is getting results for your clients. Because if you're part time, then by definition, you can only take a few and you shouldn't be focusing on scaling because you don't even have the capacity for it. Your focus should be on getting results because those results are going to pay dividends later when you get referrals from those clients or whenever you do decide to go full time. You have the reputation to back it up. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, it's, the results are one of the things I, I would love to see more of because I think it's, it's so easy for people to, to start agencies and get focused on the wrong things and they end up delivering a poor service. Yeah. That's so true and nicely summarized. And uh, uh, like fast forward 12 or maybe even 24 months in, in your life as you see it with this business, uh, do you see yourself as sort of a, a, a boutique agency, five, six people, you know, full time or, or where do you see yourself with the organization, uh, you know, a year, two years from now? Yeah. So, I mean, our, our goal over the next year, two years is to get to six figure months. I mean, that's what we want to do. So I will bring on some um, additional campaign managers and I probably will keep it relatively small because I do like the personal touch and I want to be involved. Um, but, we, you know, we do have an intent to grow and based on the results we're able to get from people, I think we can definitely do that. And that, that's been the biggest benefit to me of, of jumping in and doing this full time now is I've really been able to systematize and, and figure out you know how our company is going to operate when we do have clients and handle different things and that was just work that wasn't able to be done when I was working part time. Yeah, yeah, They're very cool, man. Yeah, we're we're going to get to how you can uh, uh, get with um, with Rory here in a second. But uh, as we come to close, I had one item on my list here, and you had mentioned uh, your superhero, which is my uh, <laughs> cute, cute, cute yeah. question uh, there. But uh, break that down for me, and then why? Yeah, so my superhero is uh, 
you know, Major Richard D. Winters, he was the head of Easy Company in World War II. It's the, the unit, the military unit that Band of Brothers was based on. And okay. yeah, so if you've seen the miniseries, that, that's who they followed. It, it just um, it just strikes me as such an incredible human being and a group of human beings because they, they did something so unthinkable at the time. I mean, these guys were left home from regular jobs, trainers, farmers, teachers, joined the military, went through a few months of military training, and then went over in part of the, the largest military invasion ever in the world, and were able to come out successful. And, and not only that, I mean, most of these people, you watch the interviews and you listen to them talk, like these guys maintained a very good sense of themselves and, and a commitment to what they were all about. And it, in the face of things that most of us would consider horrific or completely un, you know, undoable cha t challenges and um, I, I think to be able to do that, to separate yourself from what you know, to learn a new skill, to go out and apply it in the face of just completely unbelievable odds, um, you know, those are those are the people that I admire and aspire to be like. Wow, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, I've seen the Band of Brothers, uh, and I didn't know that actually. Uh, uh, very cool, very cool. Well, I uh, I mentioned um, that uh, you know uh, you could get a hold of Rory obviously through. Uh, through uh, phone and email, uh, 931-624-8673. Flash it up on the screen right there. And also, Rory at MillerMadeMedia.com. Uh, prefer the phone number, personal touch. I, I love it. In fact, uh, uh, on that, uh, Rory, do you have a recommendation for, let's say that somebody's not quite ready to jump on ship with you, but they'd like to you know, learn more about Facebook and advertising in general, uh, we obviously talked about Jason Horning. That's a, a fantastic over-the-top experience, both in terms of interaction but uh, but learning. But are there other places, or if somebody is just fairly junior, to be honest, and they want to learn Facebook, what's the best way to uh, to start? Yeah, so you mentioned Jason's content, and I think I, I've taken several Facebook ads courses over the years, and as hands down, the best content there is out there. I mean, it's just very concise and to the point. Um, you know, if you're really motivated, and especially if you're working on a tight budget, there's so much good YouTube content out there for how to set up ads and, and to do the, the mechanics of being in Facebook. But I, I will always go back to the old school advertising books because really the value that you offer as an advertiser is your ability to, to create good marketing and speak to the buyers and things like that. So, you know, books like um, Tested, Sci uh, or, yeah, Tested Advertising Methods by John Caples, Breakthrough Advertising. Yeah, there it is. It's in my bag right now. I wish I had it. Like there's, it, you know, the, those books are so good at, at helping you understand how to write and, and convey good advertising. There's really nothing more valuable for that. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's very good. In fact, uh, I had a great copywriter on the broadcast yesterday and uh, just learning copywriting and sort of, uh, uh, what is it, Halbert said, it's a uh, uh, salesmanship in print, you know, uh, the idea that you can actually write, copy, and communicate at a, at a you know, human level. I mean, psychology, right? It's the, right. the action spot. It's like, how do I present the right message at the right time? And, of course, now it's the right media, which is, you know, we were talking Facebook here. Yeah. Uh, uh, because, yeah, like the technicalities, you mentioned YouTube, et cetera. A lot of the aspects of, of setting up an ad, it's not that hard, right? But, you know, that's where the, right. uh, the despair happens and the challenges of, you know, I've spent a hundred dollars. I spent a thousand dollars. You know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars as you uh, invested in 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 quote unquote failure that turned to success. That's some hard money and learning to to get to a place where you feel successful. But yet, you know, you never understood that you have to target your marketplace with a message that resonates, with an offer that resonates, with a hook that really stands out. And so. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, and of course, I've, I've done uh, a lot of uh, sort of this digital and, and media buying, et cetera, myself and here in the agency. But it always comes down to the right message, you know, the right market, the targeting, yeah. of course, the sequencing of those messages through the customer journey from top of funnel to bottom of funnel. And that ain't done in a weekend, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, it, you know, if I bump into two people and one of them is excellent at setting up ads and another one is excellent at the traditional direct response marketing, I'll hire the direct response marketer all day because I can teach them how to create an ad. It's much harder to teach somebody else, you know, all the psychology that goes into the ad and the marketing. So yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a beautiful takeaway right there. Well, guys and gals, uh, this has been a pleasure. If you want to reach uh, Rory, just give him a ring right there. 931-624. 8673. It sounds like a shopping commercial or something. <laughs> but you know what? 
it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this has been awesome. Any final parting words or uh, notes of wisdom here, uh, Rory? Yeah, so just to, to touch back on what we've been talking about this whole time with the uh, sort of walking that line between part time and full time. Yeah. Um, if you're part time in something and you don't have a, a, a actual measurable goal for when you're going to go part time, you're messing up. You need to set a goal of, hey, I, you know, if I need five thousand dollars to live per month, then your initial goal is to save five to ten thousand dollars and then to go full time. At some point, you have to take the risk and jump because part of what will motivate you to be successful will be that risk of knowing there is no safety net. That's uh, that's killer. Burn all bridges. <laughs> yes, exactly. Burn, burn the boats. Burn, burn the ships. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, a pleasure here, Rory. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, I know we're going to be talking uh, more after this, but uh, I really appreciate you taking time today. Uh, it's always a balancing act of getting these uh, professionals on the on the line here. And I'm glad you uh, you slotted some time for me here today. So really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, John. All right. Thanks, y'all. Uh, we'll talk to you later. We're uh, going to go offline here.